This is CBC Here and Now. Just, just try to have a voice for Jordan. He was, they heard it. He was, he was very energetic, and his energy came from his emotions. The realest people you'll ever meet. Justice for Jordan. Friends of a man a police officer shot dead last week hold a quiet rally as they look for answers. Well, it was a relief because it was the words we were longing to hear. The lockout is finally over. The deal reached at DJ Composites nearly two years after the company locked out its employees. But the union calls it a win and a loss. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. A group of Jordan McKay's friends gathered near the RNC station in Cornerbrook late this afternoon searching for answers. And they held signs saying justice for Jordan. McKay died Tuesday night after he was shot by a police officer at his apartment. Here and Now's Colleen Connors was there. A quiet group, no chanting, no yelling, just holding signs for their friend, Jordan McKay. To just, just try to have a voice for Jordan. 27 year old McKay died after a police officer fired his gun and shot him almost a week ago after police were called to his home to follow up on a criminal complaint. Police say there was a confrontation and McKay was killed. The details of that night are unknown. Just, just to find the answers that everyone's looking for. Yeah, that's yeah. important. Just, to just find the answers. McKay had a long list of charges against him, like assault and assault with a weapon. The demonstrators wanted to talk about their friend, not the criminal. He was, they heard it. He was, he was very energetic, and his energy came from his emotion. That's, that's what I would say. One of the realest people you'll ever meet. Down to earth? Oh, yes. Everybody was his family. Yeah. That's what he said. Love, yeah. peace, and family. That's all that kid was about. Some of the signs read things like body cams should be mandatory, referring to the two officers who were involved. Another asked, shoot to kill? How many more do we have to have before, before we get somebody to come in there and, and really, really look and, and ask the questions? Is it in the training? I think it's in the training. McKay's friends and family know very little about what happened that night as the Ontario Provincial Police investigate the shooting. The OPP were brought to Cornerbrook to conduct an external review of the shooting and will not comment. McKay's family, his sisters and his nieces, well, they were not at the demonstration today as planned. They were speaking with the police investigators. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, after nearly two years of being locked out, workers at DJ Composites in Gander have a new collective agreement, but it comes at a cost. Just about half of the people who were employed before the lockout won't be going back to work. The union representing the workers says the new three-year agreement effectively ends one of the longest lockouts in Newfoundland and Labrador's labour history. Several hundred members of Unifor rallied earlier this fall in support of the workers who were locked out since December of 2016. And today, the union is calling the new contract a win and a loss. Well, from a positive point of view, uh, some of the egregious uh, offers that, or demands that were on the table for two years was uh, taken off by the employer for arbitration, which was a win for us because some of those were severe and we held a position for two years that we wasn't going to agree to. So to see things like that come off the table, like merit-based pay and things like that, and also like uh, step, uh, step increases each year and uh, annual increases for uh, in your uh, classification system was put back and that was something that we didn't see in the prior contract. So there was things like that which was uh, improvements for us or you may want to call it a win for us, but uh, the downfall of it is not everybody is going to be returning to work. Now Orm says the 16 people going back to work will do so in waves over the next few weeks as the company tries to find contract work to get the plant fully up and running. He says the union's goal is to help the company find more work so that more people can be hired back. A second juror has been dismissed in the retrial of Stephen Neville. Today, Justice Robert Stack excused a juror whose mother has entered palliative care. And that brings the number of remaining jurors to 10. 
Last week, another juror was excused due to a broken foot. If one more juror gets dismissed, it will automatically trigger a mistrial. At least 10 jurors are needed to render a verdict. This is already the second time Neville's case has been tried. He was found guilty of attempted murder and second degree murder in 2013, but the Supreme Court of Canada overturned the decision and ordered a new trial. The jury has been deliberating since Friday afternoon. Well, no news might not necessarily be good news for people waiting on medical test results. The government revealed a software glitch today that could be affecting hundreds of people in this province. Here now is Katie Breen is in our newsroom tonight. So Katie, what's going on with this story? Well, about 615 patients that had testing done within the last year might not have gotten their results back. That's because of a software glitch. It it had issues relaying some results to doctors and nurse practitioners. At a press conference today, Health Minister John Hagee said different kinds of testing was caught up in this, ultrasounds, CT scans, x-rays, but mostly blood work. He said there was no issue with critical results because labs will call health care providers directly when something is seriously wrong. But he said some abnormal results slipped through the cracks. If doctors or nurse practitioners went looking, there were other ways to find the information. They could have accessed results through the provincial system, and there were paper copies. But if they relied on the TELUS Health System to electronically deliver the results to their office, they would have missed the cases that weren't set out. The 615 cases skipped over represent about 0.0004% of the cases that the system handled over the last year. I'm sorry it happened, and I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not an acceptable situation. Uh, the important thing from our point of view is to identify if there's been any harm and try and remediate that. And as I say, thus far we have no indications that there has been any harm. And the second thing is to work on a process to make sure that we are safeguarded against this happening in the future. Eastern Health is now going through each of the cases one by one determine, to determine what, if any, impact there has been to each of the patients. TELUS Health, the company responsible for this, now says the problem has been resolved and letters that have been written up for affected patients were sent out today. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. One time we had a call actually from President Bush if he could bring a TV crew with him because Paula Zahn, who was uh, doing a show at the time, Good Morning America, and she wanted to do a day in the life of the president. He chose Adler Talk Labrador. <laughs> now keep in mind, you've got the Secret Service, the RCMP, and then all of a sudden we got a full TV crew, including a producer from New York, uh, showing up. Elaine Dobbin looks back on some of her favorite memories with longtime friend, President George H.W. Bush. I'll look forward to that. Um, every time I went out today, I got wetter than I had planned. Um, <laughs> yeah, once that mm -hmm. wind started blowing, it's like coming down in sheets. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was a little wet today. We're going to see uh, things generally clear out as we head through the night tonight, so that's definitely the good news, but we do have some colder air on the way. So we'll take a look at uh, the weather over the next 24 hours. We're going to see some blowing snow for the most part for Labrador. Those winds are going to pick up as we head through the overnight and then certainly into tomorrow afternoon with some newly fallen snow. Uh, slight chance of some freezing rain towards the early morning hours for parts of the island as well. And then as I mentioned, some colder temperatures on the way. Temperatures dip into the minus single digits through the overnight, at least through most of this week. But I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Well, despite the wintry weather, renovations are moving along at the oldest standing lighthouse in the province. This was the scene at Cape Spear this weekend. A crane was used to reattach the famous dome, which was removed back in August for repairs. Visitors to the most easternly point in North America will soon be able to buy a cup of coffee and sip it on a patio. That's Parks Canada's plan. All that uh, Cape Spear construction is scheduled to be completed by the summer. Well, after four years of delays, another one. The new stretch of Team Guzhu Highway has hit yet another snag. The four kilometer stretch of road cost about $59 million to build and it was set to open today. But all that wet weekend weather that Ashley delivered kept road crews from finishing on the line painting. So there is no word yet on when that work is going to be completed. But commuters in the St. John's area don't count on it being open tomorrow. 
Husky Energy says it's working on a plan to recover the failed equipment which led to the offshore oil spill a couple of weeks ago. About 250,000 liters is believed to have spilled when Husky tried to restart production after a violent storm. Husky says it has not detected any other damage to equipment. There is also no timeline for the Sea Rose to resume production. However, there are still questions about whether the regulations need to change around oil companies operating during big storms and heavy seas. The Federal Minister of Natural Resources says he'll be looking for recommendations. We need to understand uh, uh, what processes we can improve in order to make sure that when the work resumes back after a severe and big storm such as that was experienced on, uh, on this installation, that there has to be better communication uh, between the offshore board as well as uh, the companies uh, that might be impacted. And we want to make sure, and once that investigation is concluded, we will be in a position to move forward with, uh, with some recommendations. Jerome Kennedy says he's angry with Nalcor. The former Minister of Natural Resources, who helped sanction the Muskrat Falls project, testified at the public inquiry today. As Here Now's Mark Quinn reports, Kennedy says he was surprised and disappointed to learn the Crown Corporation did not share some key information about the project with him before it got the final go-ahead in 2012. One important benefit of Muskrat Falls, and let's not underestimate this, Mr. Speaker, is that we escaped the clutches of Quebec. In the days leading up to Muskrat Falls' sanction, Jerome Kennedy was an aggressive defender of the project. I can't say to you that there won't be overruns, but what I can say to you that we have confidence that the work has been done at this stage at Decision Gate 3 to ensure that the, the overruns are kept to a minimum. But today, Kennedy agreed there was a lot more he should have known that he didn't. Information that Nalcor had but didn't give to him, including the exclusion of a strategic risk allowance from cost estimates. This, this is something that, yeah, I should have been aware of. Half a billion dollars that experts said should have been included to cover the risks of going over budget. He also says the Crown Corporation didn't share information it had that strongly suggested First Power would not be available in 2017, as promised. It obviously concerns me, sir, because if there's delay in the project, Commissioner, then there's going to be increased costs. And if there are increased costs, then the cost of Muskrat Falls is going up. Uh, there was never any indication, sir, that the, this, uh, the schedule would go beyond right. what they had said. I was never told any of what you're talking about here. Yeah. And you were the minister. I was the minister. Yeah. Kennedy said he didn't learn about these gaps in his knowledge until earlier this year when he was being interviewed for the inquiry. When you pointed these things out to me one after the other, I, I, I was very surprised. I felt surprised. I felt disappointed. And I, I felt a certain degree of, of anger too, sir. Because we're putting out there, Commissioner, I'm out there every day in the public defending, and it's pretty well, it seemed like every day, Mr. I don't know, it seemed like every day I was out there in the public defending a project based on the information that's given to me by people who I have no reason to believe won't give me accurate information. Kennedy said he still doesn't believe Nalcor leaders, such as former CEO Ed Martin, did anything nefarious, but he also said he believes government and the public should have had all the information that was available to Nalcor before the project was sanctioned. Mark Quinn, CBC News. St. John's. It's now been two years since Jennifer Hillier Penny disappeared from St. Anthony, but friends and family of the missing mother are promising to keep up the fight. Over the weekend, they marched to mark the anniversary of her disappearance, and here now's Garrett Barry was there. Justice for Jennifer! More than 700 days. Justice for Jennifer! That call still not answered. We don't understand, like, why? Why has Jennifer been taken from us? I mean, we want the answers. So on Saturday, they marched to the RCMP detachment and to the steps of the home where she was last seen. Her life matters! The home of Hillier Penny's estranged husband, where her keys, phone, and purse were left behind. There's someone out there that got the answers. They need to come forward. 
And there's more than one knows. An ominous message. Someone knows something. And there's people around, there's people in this community that have the answers that we're looking for. The event was one part memorial with songs and tears and another part protest with slogans and signs and chanting. And that just goes to show the complicated emotions that the family of Jennifer Hillier Penny feel as they approach their third Christmas without any answers. It's sad, it's angry, it's frustrating, it's right. But through the tears, her memory moves on. Who's this here? Who is it? I can all of our children and her grandchildren uh, has been known and uh, we keep her in memory alive through pictures and when they get older we'll tell them about Jenna right, a beautiful person that she is and the, you know the passionate and caring and she loved children like children was her life. Jennifer was a very loving lady she was uh, very kind she was uh, supportive she was there for things going on and she would help anybody that needed help and and I know, like, to see her with her girls, she loved her girls dearly. Her family says investigators were in town just last week, but there were no significant developments to report. So the march continues. Her life matters! Care Ferry, CBC News, St. Anthony. Today is the International Day for Persons with Disabilities, and a celebration was held at Government House this morning to mark the occasion, including awards that were handed out by Empower, the Disability Resource Center. <laughs> CBC Newfoundland and Labrador won the Social Inclusion Award for Access Denied. That series took an in-depth look at the issues that persons with a wide range of disabilities face in their day-to-day -day lives. Reporter Ramona Deering and producer Jen White accepted the award on behalf of CBC. Other recipients included uh, Marie Ryan, Haley Redmond, and the Chesspenny family YMCA. Lisa Dempster, the minister responsible for the status of persons with disabilities, says her department has been busy working on accessibility legislation. I am pleased to report today to you guys that we are well underway to achieving this goal. There's a lot of work happening in my department around that. Soon you will begin hearing about a solutions-based engagement process that will start the conversation about what this legislation should look like. These windows are 160 years old. Still ahead tonight, why a local photographer and historian are documenting the stories and history behind the Basilica's windows. Hi, I'm Ashley Brawweiler with a special report, a forecast of need. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, more than 6,000 food hampers will be provided to the less fortunate. In the spirit of giving this holiday season, expect a noticeable warm front to move through the province. Join us in raising funds for the Community Food Sharing Association and local food banks throughout December. There's a 100% chance of making the holidays brighter. Visit cbc.ca slash feednl to donate today.
Welcome back once again. And Ashley, you're beginning to realize just how variable our <laughs> weather can right be. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly this weekend. Did you get out at all this weekend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Saturday or Sunday rather was you know, rain, snow, everything, sun. It was beautiful. I loved it. <laughs> that makes me happy. Uh, but as far as weather goes today, it was just windy and rain. I guess we did see pretty much everything today as well, especially on the Avalon. But uh, the winds really were the story earlier today. Uh, if we take a look at those numbers, reached about 81 kilometers per hour in St. John's, uh, 107 for Bonavista. And then we've got uh, those strong winds for the Rec House area as well, 122 kilometer per hour wind was recorded. Uh, now we are starting to see those winds die down. The wind warnings have now ended, but we um, and we're going to continue to see the winds die down as we head through the night tonight, especially for the island. But then along the coast, uh, the Labrador coast, we are looking at those winds picking up after midnight and then continuing uh, to strengthen as we head through the day tomorrow, somewhere between 50 and 70 kilometer per hour winds with some falling snow will lead to blowing snow and reduced visibilities as we head through the afternoon tomorrow. And then they'll strengthen even more so as we head towards the evening hours, uh, gusting from 70 to uh, closer to 90 kilometers per hour for Cartwright. And then down uh, through most of the island, it does look like winds will be gusting somewhere between 20 and 50 kilometers per hour through the day tomorrow. So we did see all that rain for the most part today started messy. And then uh, same thing for parts of central. The it should clear out or it already is clearing out tonight. We could see uh, some lingering drizzle potentially, but for the most part, we'll see that mix of sun and, or rather uh, partly cloudy skies as we head through the overnight tonight. And then uh, some more flurry activity expected for Labrador. Now those temperatures will be probably above zero for the most part for the Avalon along the south coast as well, with the temperature hovering around one degree for Port Basque and then around the freezing mark for the west coast, Grand Falls, Windsor and Gander uh, sitting in around minus one through the overnight tonight. St. Anthony at minus four with that chance of flurries and then minus 16 in Lab City. So quite chilly overnight tonight. A little bit of a wind chill uh, thanks to some northwest winds gusting near 40 kilometers per hour. Then that temperature is actually going to climb for Nain up to about minus three. But we are looking at about two to five centimeters of snow through the overnight and with those winds picking up. Again, we're looking at that blowing snow. So a little disturbance moves through tonight. A little bit of a cold front pushes through. With this, we could see the risk of some freezing rain along the south coast towards the Buren and parts of central in the early morning hours. Otherwise, we'll see things change back over to rain through the day. Not anything significant as far as amounts go. Might pick up a few quick centimeters through the morning. And then we're going to start to see those temperatures drop in behind that. A big change on the way. We'll see temperatures drop down to the minus single digits uh, into the afternoon, especially along the coast, and then continue to do so towards the island, or rather towards the Avalon in the evening hours. With clearing skies up through Labrador for the most part along the coast, we're going to see that chance of flurry stick around. So here's a look at those temperatures tomorrow. Three degrees for Marystown, four for uh, St. John's. Otherwise, again, those temperatures dropping to the minus single digits. And then we're going to see that uh, up through Labrador as well. Minus 13, the overnight low, for, or rather the afternoon high for Lab City. And then minus four for Nain. And then we're going to see, uh, eventually we're going to see those uh, sun peak out for the Straits as well sitting around minus three through the day in those northwest winds, as I mentioned, picking up towards the evening hours. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm. <laughs> Not too bad. Not too bad at all. <laughs> so, of course, we all know Christmas right around the, the corner, coming quickly. Very quickly. For yep. some, you know, it's stressful time, the cleaning <laughs> and the cooking and all of that. But for others, it is the wrapping. Yes, and uh, fortunately, CBC Feed NL Day is around the corner, so you can help the hungry by donating and leaving <laughs> and leave the wrapping to us, yes. I should say. They're both being very generous because I recently tried to wrap some <laughs> gifts for people around here. It turned into a bit of a Christmas crisis of sorts, and the, the whole thing reminds me of a, of a song. <laughs> Anthony had a bad Christmas feeling. Press need a wrap from the floor up to the ceiling. Though he's a newsman, incomparable to wrapping presents, he's really terrible. Tell me what's Christmas TV news got to do? His best friend Debbie asked for a basketball. Peter got a puppy but ran off down the hall. Carolyn wanted a new toboggan, but he slipped and he tripped and he hit his noggin. Poor old Anthony. Don't look good for you. The 
You might think it's hysterical, but he needed a Christmas miracle. Just then Santa showed up on his sleigh. He said, come with me, there's a better way. December 14th, they went to the Avalon Mall. CBC friends were waiting there one and all. Bop, 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 bop. They wrapped his presents in a flash. All they asked for was a little cash. He said, by golly, you saved my Christmas day. Go be part of the big sensation and help the community food sharing association. December 14th is feed and help for you. Wrap your presents and help the hungry too. Turn your Christmas red and green if you're feeling kind of blue. Oh, wow. What do you have to say for yourself there, I'm Anthony? I'm speechless. <laughs> God, Seemed challenge. like a good idea at the time, Debbie <laughs> and Ashley. But it is a great event, uh, and if you're all thumbs when it comes to wrapping, or even if you're not, went there, uh, we've done this before, did it last year. Lots of people show up, so we can kind of rescue, and it's for an excellent cause, so uh, stay tuned. We'll have more details on that. But now you know what you're getting, so I'll have to change that. <laughs> Basketball. <laughs> Your favorite. That's what I wanted. Your favorite. <laughs> All right, we'll move things along now. Kids from across the province went hull to hull this weekend in an annual model boat race. The remote controlled crafts took over the Marine Institute's flume tank here in St. John's. And it was a chance for kids to design and race their very own naval creations, as well as to open doors for up and coming marine engineers. Hey, she's yours, Ethan. We give them about $400 worth of remote control gear, and we tell them that. We, we have the mechanics for them, but they have to put it together. They're the ones who have to design the boat. They have to come up with the materials, the shape, the arrangement, and it, it's totally up to them. We just give them the equipment, and they make it work. Yeah, we're just going to bring you up here. Uh, I'm assuming we're on new. Uh, well, we got two sewage pipes, and then we glued it or epoxied it on so it would stay in place. So now there's no water, it's just air in them, so that should make it flow. There was a 3D printed model, I believe that was a Clarenville group. Uh, there was another group that uh, made it out of just PVC pipe and did a fantastic job. Uh, a lot of them were made out of just styrofoam, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see the designs and the materials that they select because they're young enough that they don't know they can't do it yet, so they come up with a lot of innovative solutions that we as instructors would never see. I, this is the seventh or eighth year, I believe, uh, and each year it's grown and been more successful, I think, every year. We talked about things that she used to do when she was younger, and we told her like what we do now. Decades apart, they spent weeks exchanging letters. Why a grade six class is cozying up to some St. John seniors. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. An old school pen pal program is delivering insight into the past. For about a month, some St. John students have been swapping stories with seniors. It recently resulted in the two groups meeting face to face. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has their story. A group of sixth grade students from Learys Brook put on a bit of a performance for seniors at Kenny's Pond Retirement Home. The younger generation showed off what they had learned from their pen pal program. The idea was the brainchild of Claire Rouleau and Aaron Windsor. So we wanted to teach kids about how aging works and how everybody ages differently and to not be afraid of that and to stay away from stereotypes and stuff like that. On Friday, the seniors and the students met face to face for the first time. It's actually really exciting. Why is that? Because we've been writing for about a month, I think. Yeah, a little over a month. And now we finally get to meet her. Emily Ralph and Aloel Ring were partnered up with pen pal Ruth Goff. We wrote to Ruth about what we liked and she wrote us about what she liked and we talked about things that she used to do when she was younger and we told her like what we do now. So we're all going to go back to our places. The seniors were a little taken back at first that a group of young students wanted to write them letters, but both sides remained committed to the intergenerational project. Very surprised. I have to say, I was very, very surprised, but I was delighted. Letter writing was a new process for many of the Learys Brook sixth graders. It's kind of like a totally new age now, so usually it's like not, it's very rare to write by hand, so usually we just text, but I really liked it. It was really fun. Windsor and Rouleau were able to make the project happen thanks to an Art Smart grant from ArtsNL. That money has run out, but the magic of what happened, thanks to pen and paper, has not. It's so exciting. I have to say I was really moved seeing the bus pull up, you know, and finally have the meeting of the two worlds. Um, it's a small project in scope, but we hope to do more of it, and uh, I think it's significant for everyone involved. The Merry Christmas, isn't that nice? The students each brought Christmas cards for their new pals, making this holiday season one that many here won't soon forget. Absolutely wonderful. I have to, I, I really sincerely mean that. It's lovely to meet you both. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Today marks the second day of Hanukkah. Last night, the Jewish community in St. John's celebrated the start of the holiday. An eight-foot menorah was erected in Bannerman Park, and members of the community sang prayers and also paid tribute to the victims of the synagogue massacre in Pittsburgh in October. St. John's Mayor Danny Breen was invited to light the menorah and mark the occasion. Diversity in our city uh, over the past uh, over the past couple of decades has been incredible. Um, and you know, the Jewish community is, is a large community here in the city. And uh, you know, my message is one of uh, of St. John's and wanting to be an inclusive and safe city. Yeah. Well, it's only the second year because we've been here for just under two years. But this is something that our teacher, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rabbi, the head of the Chabad Worldwide Movement, inspired his followers to do, to have public menorah lightings to publicize the miracle of Hanukkah. And Hanukkah lasts until Monday. Well, there's some new light shining on the stained glass windows at the Basilica of St. John the Baptist in St. John's. A new book has photographs and stories about all 63 stained glass windows in the Basilica. Historian John Fitzgerald and photographer Robert Young put the book together. Some of these windows are 160 years old. It's a great time to come and see them. Um, while they're, they're just before we're about to, to take them apart and restore them. He said we might as well document this while we have the chance and um, so here we are with the book. Stuff happens. Churches burn down, windows have to get destroyed, you know, birds crash into windows. We already have one window with a, with a piece missing. All of these things are captured here now. So we've got Gower Street United, we've got the Kirk, we've got the Anglican Cathedral. All these churches are equally as historic and have are full of windows that we would love to document. <laughs> so we very well may.
Beautiful. Beautiful right. indeed. And Very thanks pretty. to Heather Barrett, host of CBC Radio's Weekend AM, for that story. Yeah. He was asked, what is your favorite place to visit? And he said, well, most Americans would never hear of this little place, but it was in a little community in Canada on the coast of Labrador called Adlatuck. Remembering her longtime friend, the late President George H.W. Bush. Debbie's conversation with Elaine Dobbin is next. Condolences are pouring in from around the world for the late U.S. President George H.W. Bush, who died Friday at the age of 94. But some people here are remembering him for his connection to this province. Bush's passion for salmon fishing and a close friendship with the late Craig Dobbin, founder of CHC Helicopters, brought him to Newfoundland and Labrador many times. In the late 80s and early 90s, the 41st U.S. president visited the province and stayed at Craig Dobbin's camp north of Hopedale. Bush fished many rivers like the Eagle and also others on the island, Long Harbor and Gander. Craig's wife Elaine Dobbin had a front row seat to all of these visits and she joins me now. Thank you very much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Not very often that people get to befriend the President of the United States. How did all of this happen? Well, he was a great lover, an avid fisher person. Uh, Brian Mulroney, who was the Prime Minister at the time, and John Crosby, I believe was the Minister of Fisheries, contacted Craig and asked if Craig would invite him fishing. Craig said absolutely, and then he came every year after that. And your friendship as uh, two couples grew, didn't it? It did. Craig and I were invited at the end of each season before they left Kenny Bunkport in September. We went to visit with them there. We did many things with them, like join President Bush on board the USS Truman. We uh, attended some of his fundraisers. We really did a lot of things, had a lot of fun and always, always enjoyed being in their company. And Craig and uh, the Prez always uh, enjoyed their nightly drinks together. <laughs> <laughs> and President Bush was no different than Craig in that way, in many other ways. Uh, but President Bush was just one of those special, gentle people. Mm. 
Tell us a little bit about uh, how those trips to Labrador were. I uh, gather the president really enjoyed himself there. Are there any stories that you can tell about uh, the well, fun there's times? Some I probably won't tell, <laughs> but we had a lot of fun times. One time we had a call actually from President Bush asking him uh, if he could bring a TV crew with him because um, Paula Zahn, who was uh, doing a show at the time, Good Morning America, and she wanted to do a day in the life of the president. It was his choice where? He chose Adlatok, Labrador. <laughs> now keep in mind, you've got the Secret Service, the RCMP, and we're very limited in space, and then all of a sudden we got a full TV crew, including a producer <laughs> from New York, showing up. And Craig said, where are you gonna put them? I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> anyway, we got them all in and got them all sorted and had a wonderful time and the show was a great success actually. There are so many stories that are connected to those days, but mm -hmm. one that stands out is when the president fell in a bog hole he almost lost his life. Did uh, Craig regale everybody with that story when it turned out well? Well, <laughs> we weren't allowed to talk about it actually afterwards uh, because many of the U.S. press were looking for to uh, do a reenactment. And Craig contacted the president and the president said, it was something I'd rather forget about. <laughs> but you tell me the details. What I happened? will. <laughs> um, we were flying from Devil's Lake to Long Harbor and the fog came down and three helicopters had to settle in, uh, actually it was along the Bjorn Peninsula Highway, uh, in, in, in the bush, but it was an opening. President Bush had to go to the boys' room. He went to the boys' room, uh, and I saw him coming back, and I made the comment, I just saw the president, but I don't see him anymore. Oh my. And with that, the RCMP and the Secret Service dashed off, came back, they got him out okay, but the big thing for President Bush was that he had sense enough to put his arms out, and the bog was up to his armpits. Uh, that's what saved his life. Wow. And the RCMP officer was full of mud, and I looked at him and I said, what happened to you? He said, I have President of the United States on my watch. If I lost him, I may as well go with him, so I <laughs> jumped right in. And he did, he jumped in, pushed him out, and the Secret Service pulled both of them out from there. As we talked about at the beginning of the interview, you and Craig and Barbara mm -hmm. and George became good friends, and you are invited to the president's funeral in Texas. Yes, I'm invited to the private ceremony, not the state, uh, which is a little more intimate. It's for family and friends, invitation only, and I'm very honored to be included amongst them. Um, I never thought about going, but I, yes, I'm going to say my final farewell to that wonderful, wonderful, gentle soul. Elaine Dobbin, thank you very much for sharing some of your memories with us. Thank you so very much. It was a real honor to be here. It was lovely to hear yeah. from her. Yeah, quite the stories too, of course. Uh, long life and a very successful president. Very, uh, very different time in politics when he was the Republican president compared you to- You might say. Yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> liftoff of Anne McLean to beat St. Jacques and Oleg Kononenko to the International Space Station. It was a picture-perfect launch. Canadian astronaut David St. Jacques has arrived at the International Space Station. The crew orbited Earth four times before the Russian Soyuz space capsule coupled with the ISS. They received a warm welcome from their colleagues on board when the hatch opened.
I mentioned earlier, I got a little soaked heading over to the House of Assembly, but perhaps I should be happy that it wasn't colder. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the upside of the rain, I suppose. That's right. Yeah, we've got these uh, warmer temperatures right now, but as we head through towards next, or rather the middle of the week, we're going to see a significant temperature drop and that's going to be right across the board. So if we take a look at what we're expecting, everything should change over to flurries through the overnight on Tuesday and then uh, continue through the day on Wednesday. It looks like not a whole lot is going to happen though, but we are in that northwest flow, which means those colder temperatures will make their way down towards uh, the island into the afternoon on Thursday. Some lingering flurries expected in onshore flow along the west coast. Otherwise, it looks like a nice day. Mix of sun and clouds, slight chance of a few flurries for the most part and then up through Labrador things uh, should stay quite nice through the day maybe some more cloudy periods towards the afternoon hours but pretty uh, relatively calm day into Wednesday it's Thursday when things start to change so here's a look at uh, the forecast some mostly uh, gonna see that sunshine in the forecast but there's that drop in temperature so down to the minus single digits right across the board Beer and Peninsula looking at uh, temperatures hovering just below zero through the afternoon and then uh, down to about minus eight minus nine up through Labrador Lab City sitting at minus 13 those overnight lows though are dipping down into the minus teens and uh, we're just looking at that chance of flurries, as I mentioned, along the west coast and then uh, potentially through parts of central as well. But it'll be uh, scattered through the day. So looking uh, a little bit longer range in the forecast towards Thursday, there's uh, a little bit of a system that's going to potentially move through. Now with this system, this model specifically is showing quite a significant amount for at least the Avalon and then spreading north through the day on Friday and then into Saturday that pulls away but we could see uh, some more flurry activity or light snow moving in behind that but here's what I'm thinking so uh, as far as agreement goes with the models we're gonna spell that out for you so GFS one of the models the American model and the European model don't really agree on where that system's gonna move so you can see just clipping uh, the island and then GFS has it way offshore so there is a potential we, we may not even see this system at all but uh, if not we could see quite a significant amount amount of snow and that will happen if it does Thursday night into Friday. So definitely something that we'll be keeping our eye on as we head through the next couple of days. So here's a look at the forecast for now. It looks breezy for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland right through to Wednesday and then it'll pick up late day uh, Thursday if that system does make that track. Uh, looks like about minus two is the afternoon high. You can see those temperatures dipping uh, into the overnight into the minus single digits. By Friday we'll see a little bit of a warm up hovering around the zero degree mark and then uh, that sunshine returning on Saturday. Uh, Flurries the story essentially right through central Newfoundland. Just a, a few peaks of sun on Wednesday and Thursday potentially as well. Dipping down to minus teens overnight. Uh, minus five for Western Labrador. And then again, it just looks gray with that chance of sun peaking out uh, for midweek otherwise. Uh, Eastern Labrador looking at temperature around minus eight on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, sitting around minus 11. And then that chance of flurries late day. And then same thing for Western Labrador. Don't really see anything as far as significant snowfall goes over the next uh, couple of days, uh, but it does look like plenty of sunshine as we head towards the weekend. Thanks, Ashley. It's been more than two years since Jennifer Hillier Penny disappeared from St. Anthony. Her phone, purse and keys were all left in the home of her estranged husband where she was last seen. Her family says they have not learned anything more in the two years since her disappearance. Here's more from our Garrett Barry's interview with the family. Today, we, you know, we would hope that it would not be two years since Jennifer went missing that we wouldn't have the answers. Um, today is, is very emotional for all of us. It's a time when we try to reflect on Jennifer and you know all that her personality and we don't understand like why? Why has Jennifer been taken from us? I mean we want the answers. I have never lived with something like this. I can't even imagine what it is that you're going through. Does it, does it get any easier after two years, three years? It never gets easier. Easier. It's, it's actually harder. It's, it's harder because every day you're, you have to face that Jennifer is no longer with us and we, we don't have the answers that we were looking for. So every day is more difficult than the day before. 
And, and do you still live with hope that she, that you might get the answer you're looking for? Yes, we are, we're going to fight for the answers that we're looking for. Jennifer's memory will definitely be here and we will be fighting for justice for Jennifer. And something that also I found really striking, I mean, there, there are toddlers here, there are grandchildren here, there are really young children here. Not that it's inappropriate for them to be there, but I just wonder how they imagine, how they understand what's happening. If you're two or three or even six, this has been such a big part of your life for so long, right? And, and I'm wondering if you could just try to describe to me, you know, you, you have your grandchildren here, who this is all they've known was Jennifer not being around, was her being missing. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of impact do you think that has on, the, on your grandchildren and, and toddlers and the young people in her family? As, as a family, we want our to Jennifer not to be forgotten. So all of our children and her grandchildren uh, has been known and uh, we keep her in memory alive through pictures and when they get older we'll tell them about Jennifer, the beautiful person that she is and the, you know the passionate and caring and she loved children like children was her life so you know we're going to continue on with that and, and the note of Jennifer will not be forgotten. Welcome back and to Thunder Bay, Ontario now, where police say they are investigating a disturbing video posted on social media over the weekend. One that appears to show an officer striking a teenager strapped to a stretcher. Go to the hospital. What's That's enough. Well, it's not clear why the young woman is strapped down, but she's been identified as a 17-year-old from a First Nations community near Thunder Bay. Indigenous leaders are outraged by the video, saying there is no justification for such treatment. They're calling for an independent investigation. Now, this comes amid an already ongoing investigation into racism by the Thunder Bay Force. Well, it's taken a long time, but for one particular athlete, it's certainly been worth the wait. Canadian weightlifter Christine Girard has finally received her medals from two Olympic Games. Gold medalist and Olympic champion, Christine Girard. Now, Girard won gold in the 2012 Olympic Games in London and bronze from the Beijing Games in 2008. Why now, you ask? Well, Girard is the latest Olympian to receive medals following the retesting of more than 1,500 samples from both games. So in London, 
The top two finishers both tested positive for banned substances. Gerard, who has since retired from the sport, is Canada's first ever Olympic champion in weightlifting. Vindication for her, being yeah. clean athlete. That's true. How sweet it must Fantastic. feel. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that feels. Had to wait good. a while, but wow, you don't get two medals from two different games in one ceremony. <laughs> it it's is. It's a record of its own, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah, ten years later. Yeah, it must be nice. Mm -hmm. So something else that's nice. Oh. I saw this picture yes. earlier wow. today. Take Just tell us today. about it. That's uh, those are star trails. Okay. Okay, yeah. I hear science lesson coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, choose where, or figure out where it's from first. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice. Labrador, yeah. somewhere Labrador, in Labrador. Yeah. Labrador. Uh, yeah. Wabush. <laughs> you're just so good. So what are those things called? Star trails. So what uh, it is, is you essentially, um, you're just opening up the exposure on the camera and then the the uh, stars move and then that's what you get. Oh, okay. This is a photography thing, not it's a photography. meteorology oh, thing. Oh, definitely not a meteorology thing, but okay. it's gorgeous. You have to see the clear, it has to be clear skies to see it, so technically it is. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful effect, Jason. Yes, Jason Edwards sent us that photo. If you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah. And you can charge Ashley because that's her new screensaver. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you it's true. Hey. We're going to see <laughs> snow like that, you know, or we've already have probably right. in some parts of the province. Yeah, it could come maybe Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our program. Thanks very much for being with us. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you tomorrow.